beautiful morning. It may be raining outside, but it's still a wonderful, great day uh, because the Lord woke us all up this morning. That's what makes it great. Praise God. I thank you so much for joining us for another opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, David said this, he said, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. I hope you know he's mighty good this morning. So please, this is an opportunity to worship God, to praise God, to let him know that you love him and that you appreciate all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do in your life and in my life. Praise God. So thank you for joining. Join us now uh, in a wonderful musical selection for our wonderful male chorus behind me. Uh, God be the glory for him. Amen. So if you want to sing along, sing along. This is a time to praise God. Amen. Right. Glory to God.
Glory to God. Fantastic. We just thank God so much for that musical offering blessing us real good. Uh, all month long, beloved, we've been having moments in black history. Last Sunday, we had Naima Edwards, amen, to come and to bless us with a moment of reflection in black history. And today, we have Jackson Grant coming to bless us with another moment in black history. If you're right at home, clap your hands, give God praise for him. Pray for him as he comes at this time to be a blessing to all of us. Amen. Praise God. Come on. Still away, still away, 
Still away to Jesus. Still away. Still away home. I can long to stay here. Amen. So you're going to have to pray. Amen. <laughs> Ask the Lord to help you. 
as you praise your child. Glory to God. Uh, right in your homes, heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so gracious to us, to touch us with your finger of love, just to be able to wake up this morning and see another day. Thank you, Lord, for making things as well as they are. They could be a million times worse. So, Lord, we come with a spirit of gratitude. We come thanking you for everything that we have, Lord. Even the things that we know we may want, Lord, we thank you for meeting all of our needs. God, we bless you for that. We bless you for healing. We bless you for strength. That you are our strength. You are our source. God, you are everything we stand in need of and so much more. God, we thank you that you are our creator, you are our Lord, our King, our Master. God, we thank you that, Lord, you, we can cast our cares on you, and you promise that you will sustain us. God, we bless you for that right now. So we, we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, that you would help us to enter truly into worship now, to connect with your presence. Let your Holy Spirit fall fresh on us. God, not just those that are right here in the building, oh, Lord, at 15143 Avenue Church Road, but God, to meet people right in their homes right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, sit down at the dinner table. Sit down, Lord, right there by someone's bedside. Sit down in someone's uh, couch there recliner. Be right there, oh Lord, in their midst. Touch them, oh God. In the name of Jesus, meet them at the point of their need. God, you said, you delight yourself in me. You will give them the desires of their heart. God, bless them right yes, now. Yes, From God. the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Yes, Do a great work in their lives. God, we give you praise and glory for it now. Have your way in this place and have your way in people's homes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Glory to God. Don't change that channel. Don't be blessed. Amen.
praise God. Wow, I know your heart's got to be set on fire. God truly is good. I hope you realize that your soul is anchored in the Lord. Praise God. What a mighty God we serve. Glory to God. Thank you so much. Uh, to this male ensemble. You ought to give God praise at home for them. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Uh, beloved, if you have your Bibles with you, do me a huge favor. Uh, turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew uh, chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Amen. I'll give you a moment to get there. Give you a moment to get there. Matthew chapter 6. Amen. I want to read for your hearing and understanding verses 9 through 13, just as we read on last Sunday. Glory to God. All right, Matthew chapter 6. Let's see here. From the NIV translation, we'll give you a moment um, to get there while you make your pages through the walk. If your fingers through the walk, you can do your pages of scripture. Um, the word of God reads uh, from this NIV translation, again, starting at verse 9. This, this is Jesus talking here. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, one translation, or give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I'll note this, some of you probably have said this, and I may share it a little bit later um, in the preaching of God's word. Uh, we oftentimes say, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may not see it written in your translation. Uh, it was something that was believed to be part of a late manuscript. Uh, and so you may not see it there, but it was believed to be taken potentially from David, one of his exaltations where he would declare such a thing about being thine is the kingdom of power. Uh, and so this is why we say that, but in other later translations, uh, you may have that additional, uh, that last verse that I just mentioned. So that's why you may not see it in your translation right now. Praise God. I, I want to uh, do the uh, final message on this one to wrap this particular pericope of scripture, this context of scripture. I want to wrap that up on today. Um, again, the title is Lord, Teach Us How to Pray. We all need um, to truly know how to pray, to be taught how to pray. Because um, sometimes you may find yourself all by yourself, and you're going to need to have a talk with Jesus. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So let's take a moment. Uh, let's bow before the presence of our Lord before we preach this word. God, I thank you and I glorify your name for such a privilege and such a time as this to bring forth your word, O oh Lord. Use me, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Use me to preach it, O oh God. Help people, Lord, to see absolutely none of me but all of thee. Help them to know that it is you that's doing the speaking. So speak to our hearts now via the presence of your Holy Spirit. Empower us, enlighten us, O oh Lord. Encourage us, O oh Lord, to truly learn how to pray. No matter how old or how young we are, teach us, O oh Lord, how to pray right now. God, I thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already experienced. Now take us just a little bit higher in you. Touch somebody and save somebody's soul. Make somebody whole. It's in Jesus' name I pray. If you believe that, say amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, teach us how to pray. So last Sunday, um, we explored how the disciples wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray. Instead of asking how to perform miracles or to do the impossible, uh, get this, beloved, they still ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. 
the disciples clearly saw a connection between uh, Jesus' miracles and the magnetic characteristics of his ministry and his prayer life. They witnessed how he avoided using vain repetitions devoid of meaning because within their hearts, they only wanted to be seen as holy and praised as someone righteous by people. Sidebar for a moment, beloved, that's why when you pray, you don't have to sound like you are super spiritual. Mm -hmm. Preaching the bread, pooping the bread, or reminding everybody that you can quote scripture better than Jesus. See, they also experience getting up early in the morning, going off to a solitary place away from everybody just to talk to the Heavenly Father. See, this is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 6, when thou prayest, King James Version, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Therefore, praying in the synagogue, in public, and or with a crowd of people was no substitute for private prayer with the Lord himself. Somebody say, Lord, teach us. See, together we learn that if we honestly desire prayer instruction, then we should understand the importance of reverencing his name. See, before we ask or petition God for anything, we should have reverence or reverence God as our Father who is in heaven because he made everything. I hope you realize that. See, Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether by thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things, get this, all things were created by him and for him. See, that's the God with whom we are talking to when we pray. See, we revere his name because Jesus said, Hallowed it be thy name, King James Version. Get this, that means we are asking God the Father to do something in our lives that brings him glory. See, secondly, we are learning how to pray when we release everything to Almighty God. That's why Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this part of the Lord's prayer involves releasing our will, our understanding, knowledge, and opinions for the sovereign will of Almighty God. Finally, let me help you. We were instructed to rely on him, that is God the Father, for daily provisions. We now understand that God wants us to ask him to meet our daily needs because it teaches us how to depend on him for our most critical needs in life. I hope you got that. This is the last week's message. See, today, though, beloved, if we want the Lord to teach us to how to pray, then we must repent at, as often as possible. It's going to get quiet already. See, Jesus said we should pray and forgive us our debts as we forgive our devils. Let's be clear here. Jesus is not saying we should ask God to grant our financial request for a chapter 11 bankruptcy. Although one's financial debts in the Roman Empire was punishable with a prison sentence and pain and great tragedy for the indebted person, including their family. Here, Jesus uses the word debt to represent one's sins. 
See, therefore, we owe a debt to God because we have repeatedly disobeyed him. How many of you know that you owe God? Or oh, every hand ought to be lifted right there. See, whether we choose to admit it or not, all of us owe a debt to God. See, no matter how holy we think we are, no matter how often we have come to church pre-pandemic, or how much money we put in the offering plate, or we put on online through PayPal, come on somebody, we still owe a debt to God. For the Bible says, not me, uh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah puts it this way. He says, all our righteousness are but filthy rags. Paul said it this way. There is no one righteous, not even one. See, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, have mercy. See, because of Christ sacrificing his life for us, he paid our full, not half, not part, but full, full debt of sin, which spiritually granted us forgiveness of all of our sins, even unto eternal life. See, however, Jesus knows that we as his children sometimes, come on, let's be real, sometimes still yield to sin. Now, since we sometimes still miss the mark, make all kinds of mistakes, and every now and then succumb to the weakness of our fleshly desires, we should repent, Lord, forgive us of our debts. Let me help you. The Apostle John said it this way, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, if you have repented of your sins in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. And how many of you know that the Lord has already forgiven you? See, that's a whole new way of thinking and living when you already know that Christ forgave you. I wish I could stay there. See, when you're forgiven, you are set free. See, you are delivered from the bondage of sin. From whom the sun sets free, I hope somebody finishes that, is free indeed. See, get this, when you're forgiven, you are in right relationship with the Father. You see, when you experience true forgiveness, you have peace in your life. You don't let anybody use your past sins against you. See, when you're forgiven, you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And that's why it's hard for some people to be free to worship regardless of their location, uh, whether in church or at home but, or in the car. It is hard for them to be free to worship because they allow other people, church folk, to remind them of their past by the mere look on their faces. See, however, the moment you realize that there now that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, the moment you realize that his blood has washed all of your sins away, you will be free to worship. Oh, I wish I could stop the service right there and we just take a quick praise break because I recognize that when you are free in Christ, you don't mind lifting up your hands. You don't mind giving God the glory. You don't mind shouting unto him. You don't mind doing a little dance. Although you should cut a rug in the club. You don't mind changing partners with Christ. Because when you're free in him, you don't mind giving him the best praise and the best glory that you can give him, no matter what people think. Because you understand that they didn't save your soul. They didn't make you whole. They, they didn't come and forgive you. Only Christ did that for you. 
forgive me. Oh, I'm going to work it in there for a moment. But get this. Notice Jesus said, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let me quickly point out that Jesus is not teaching that we are forgiven by God because we have forgiven other people. Oh, I'm going to break that down. See, this is that is not the gospel because our forgiveness is not based on our works. Rather, forgiveness of other people is proof that our sins must have already been forgiven and that we possess salvation. Oh, I wish I could break it down. Therefore, extending mercy or forgiveness to others is necessary evidence that we have received forgiveness ourselves. Can I help you? In other words, you cannot forgive people if you have not been forgiven yourself. You can't give what you don't have. I wish I could preach it. See, there, let me help you. There's a story about a traveler making his way with a guide through the jungles of Burma. They came to a shallow uh, but wide river and waded through it to the other side. When the travelers came out of the river, numerous leeches had attached to his torso and legs. His first instinct, y'all know it, was to grab them and pull them off. Yes, uh, this guy stopped him though, some of y'all know this, warning that pulling the leeches off would only leave, watch this, tiny pieces of them, that's the leeches, under the skin. Ooh, that's gross. Eventually, infection would set in. The best way, however, to rid the body of the leeches, the guy that advised, was to bathe in a warm balsam bath for several minutes. This would soak the leeches and soon they would release their hold on the man's body. See, when I've been significantly injured by another person, I cannot simply yank the injury from myself and expect that all of that bitterness, malice, and emotion will be gone. I hope you're listening. Resentment still hides under the surface. The only way to become truly free of the offense and to forgive others is to pay, beloved, in the soothing bath of God's forgiveness of me. See, when I finally fathom the extent of God's love in Jesus Christ, forgiveness of others is a natural outflow. See, in other words, when you know that God loves you, when you think about God's magnificent mercy in your life, when you think about he waited years for you just to realize his forgiveness, when you think about how good he has been to you as a natural outflow, you forgive every person that has ever wronged you. Lord, teach us how to break it up words, beloved. The deeper you go in Christ's forgiveness, the more you recognize how much he loves you and how much he looked beyond your faults and still met your needs. The greater Christ's love dwells in you, the more you are able to share it with everyone else. Second, let me help you, beloved. We need God's realignment. Jesus said, lead us not into temptation. See, if your car has ever lost its front end alignment, you know that it has a tendency to drift off course. Say amen, somebody. See, it becomes a struggle to steer straight, which over time causes the tires to prematurely wear out faster than normal. I don't have no witnesses. See, beloved, every day we have to contend with an adversary called Satan that seeks to move us off course through the seductive power of temptation. As a consequence, our spirit struggle to steer straight in the direction of the Savior, where over time 
we prematurely wear out. See, therefore, Jesus encouraged us to call down God's power to lead us in the right direction and keep us away from all evil. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to constantly pray for the power of God to lead us away from the enemy's tactics because all of us are tempted. Say amen. See, all of us receive a special invitation to sin from the devil. It's kind of like Capital One's commercials that have Samuel Jackson saying, what's in your wallet? Instead, instead for us, beloved, it's what's in your invitation to sin's party. Because everybody will get an invitation. The question is, what's in it? See, you see beloved. Some of us are invited to get revenge. Some of us are invited to cuss somebody out, to lie with a straight face, to cheat on our taxes, to get a side piece, and I don't mean from KFC, to throw shade at somebody, to be mean and nice nasty, to tear through a family sized bag of Lay's potato chip, half a pound cake with a half gallon of Hagen Dazs ice cream. Oh, some of us are tempted. Y'all ain't got it. Yes, it all goes all of our invitations to sin may be different. All of us receive them. And let's be clear, the Lord, beloved, never leads anybody to temptation. The apostle James puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 13. He said, let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. For God to tempt us would mean God wants us to fail or fall into the devil's trap. And that's why James further purported, but every man is tempted. That's woman too, y'all. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's why we have to pray to the Lord to realign or redirect us by giving strength to overcome temptation because Satan and his little imps, beloved, will exploit our lusts and weaknesses at every opportunity. Somebody say, Lord, have mercy. Yes, they do. See, I don't care how holy you are. I don't care if you've been in church all your life. Every, yes, I did say it. Every last one of us are tempted. I'm going to help you, beloved. The story is told. Uh, beloved, of a certain African tribe uh, that learned an easy way to capture ducks in a river. Catching their agile and wary dinner would be a feat indeed. So they formulated a plan. The tribesmen learned to go upstream, place a pumpkin in the river, and let it slowly float down into the flock of ducks. Y'all stay with me at first. The cautious fowl would quack and fly away. Y'all know how ducks roll. See, after all, it wasn't ordinary for pumpkins to float down the river. But the persistent tribesmen would subsequently float another pumpkin into the regathered ducks. Get this, again they would scatter only to return after the strange spear had passed. Again, the hungry hunters would float another pumpkin. This time the ducks would remain with a cautious eye on the pumpkin. And with each successive passing, the ducks would become more comfortable until they finally accepted the pumpkins as a normal part of life. Hear me good here. See, when the natives saw that the pumpkins no longer bothered the ducks, they hollowed out the pumpkins, put them over their heads, and walked right down into the river. Meandering into the midst of the tolerant fowl, they pulled them down one by one. Dinner, we got roasted duck. 
Yes, we do. See, beloved, if we don't let Jesus, some of y'all got it, amen. If we don't let Jesus realign our hearts back to him, if we uh, won't be, we, it won't be long enough until we start tolerating pumpkins. See, they have a seductive way of sneaking into certain areas of our life. They creep in one by one until we sink beneath them and enter a watery grave. That's why you want to tell somebody next to you, around you, watch out for the pumpkins around you. For our adversary is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may provide. That's why you got to pray in the name of Jesus for him to show you a way of escape. That's why you got to ask the Lord to help you to find a way to tell the truth when it's easy to lie. You got to ask the Lord to help you to keep your eyes from certain cable channels. Come on, somebody. You got to ask the Lord to help you to walk away from lottery numbers. Walk away from certain aisles of the grocery store. Walk away from certain relationships that make you feel good, but you know it's no good for you. Lord, teach us how to pray. That's why Jesus said, here it is in verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. However, the NIV version says, but deliver us from the evil one. Most modern scholars agree, watch this, with the later translation because it is the most appropriate one. I hear Jesus saying we need to pray for the Father to relinquish us or deliver us from the evil one, Satan himself. See, we cannot truly overcome our temptations unless we recognize that Satan, the evil one, is behind it all. And how many of y'all know that Satan or the devil is real in the world? Yes, he is. See, Albert Moeller, author of the book of prayer that turns the world upside down, puts it this way, he says, some Christians avoid any discussion of demonic forces because they are over reacting to fanatics who possess or obsess over evil spirits and see the devil in everything. Can I help y'all? Y'all have heard this before. The devil got into my car. The devil got into my cat. The devil got into my dog. The devil got into my phone. The devil got into the IRS because they are trying to make me pay for something I shouldn't. Oh, okay, let me move on. See, still all the Christians, amen, you'll get it, fear that if we start to talk too much about the devil, we will inevitably undermine personal responsibility in our sins. See, either way, we have to acknowledge that the devil exists and that he is seeking to kill, steal, and destroy some things, back to everything he possibly can in our life. And any time, we beloved, let me help you. Any time we have churches splitting over nonsense, marriages, and families falling apart, the devil, yes, is behind it. Any time we get jealous over someone else's blessing to the point that we want to cause harm to them, the devil is behind it. Any time we have white supremacists, the proud boys, QAnon, Trump supporters, riding the U.S. Capitol, yeah, the devil is behind it. Any time we have racial inequalities and disparities, beloved, in our society, the devil is behind it. Because if you judge somebody just on the color of their skin without getting on the content of their character, the devil got to be behind it. And that's why we have to pray to deliver us from the evil one. And I came to tell somebody that if you pray this prayer of deliverance, the Lord who is mighty in battle can and will deliver you from the devil. And that's why I wish I had some folk that would lift up hands on Facebook. And don't mind 
giving him praise. Let me help it this way. I see I'm not coming through. See, in the movie called Taken, one of my favorite ones that's not for children, y'all. Liam Neeson plays Brian Mills, a former CIA operative who determines to track down his teenage daughter after she's been kidnapped by human traffickers while on a trip with a girlfriend in France. In one gripping scene, Neeson talks to his daughter's abductors. Y'all gotta go back on this one. After he's retrieved a cell phone left behind at the crime scene, so Neeson states his clear intent was to seek and save his daughter. He tells one of his abductors, listen real good, though. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. But I came to tell, I can tell you that I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that will be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. The doctor replies, Good luck. Here it is good. It's clear that Neeson is willing to pay any cost to gain back some of the time and trust he lost with his only daughter. As far as he's concerned, all of his training, skills, and time put in on the job are now focused on one thing, finding his daughter and bringing her back home. Neeson skillfully weaves his way through language barriers, government red tape, crime laws, elaborate hierarchies to find his daughter. After dispatching numerous thugs and villains, Neeson finally finds his daughter on a yacht sold as a prostitute for a wealthy Arab businessman. She collapsed into her father's arm and simply says, Daddy, you came for me. Bloody and deep, but ultimately triumphant. Neeson holds his daughter as he quietly says, I told you I would tell you. Now if I can take some holiness from Hollywood, we have someone beloved. And this above this earth, someone beloved with far more skills than Neeson. Now, far more skills than a Navy SEAL or Special Force. We have someone whose resume speaks for itself for he delivered over one million Israelites by splitting a red sea in two and then all of them walk on to dry ground he calls the son of Sam Steel, so that Joshua could have enough daylight to defeat his enemies. He delivered Daniel out of a lion's den, but not one scratch touched his body. He delivered three Hebrew men. Shadrach, Meshach, someone caught in a big Negro out of a fiery furnace, but not the smell of smoke on him. I don't know about you, but I'm talking about the Lord God Almighty. I say the Master Himself, Jesus Christ, and that same God that delivered them is the same God that will deliver you. That's why Ty Trippett said, if He did it before, He can do it again. The same God back there is the same.
Glory to God. Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Beloved, I could go on and share even more, but I'm definitely out of time. I want to transition for a moment before I, I transition to our communion experience. I want to offer an opportunity for you that may be watching online now. So you know I need to learn how to pray. I need to know for myself. You're an adult. Maybe older, doesn't matter. You're saying to yourself, I need to learn this. But the best way, in fact, the only true way to learn how to do this is to be in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To know him for yourself. Not enough for your neighbor to know them, your, your parents to know them, your friends to know them, but you, you, yeah, I'm talking to you, you have to know them for yourself. All you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus up from the dead, and the Bible says you shall be saved. Believe that today. Believe that today. If you believe that, connect with us, either through Facebook or, or to our website. Contact us. We'd love for you to be a part of this church family. And maybe you're already saved by grace through faith in Him, but you just need a local family. You need someone to love you, someone to let you know you're part of this family and that, that we love you and that we're with you. Join us. Become a part of the fellowship. Contact us. I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for all of us. Because we all need to have a deeper prayer life. Sometimes you have to revisit the fundamentals, the, the mechanics of it, the teaching of it, so to remind ourselves what it's like to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and what our hearts have felt. Thank you, Jesus, for every person that, that's listening, that has listened, that will listen to this word and participate in this worship experience. I bless you for them. I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, oh Lord, that you would touch those, Lord, that truly want a relationship with you. Call them, draw closer to them now. They need you more. They need you now. I thank you for them. Continue, Lord, to look over all of us. Continue to draw us all closer to you. Yes, God. To know you for who you really are. Yes, Lord. We thank you for that now in this Lenten season that we take those leaps of faith to pray a bit more. More intensely in fervency. Yes, oh, Truly, you are our Father. We thank you for that now. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Beloved. Which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
same way on the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, thank you for another opportunity to, to have communion. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding us of that precious sacrifice that you have made for all of us. That we don't live our lives unto ourselves, but that we live a life of sacrifice that is truly unto you. For as we share in your death, we share in your resurrection. This is not necessarily the physical death. This is the, the death of carnal desires, of our own ways of doing things. That it has to die in order to live truly through you in it. God, I thank you for these, maybe it's the cracker someone has at home or the grape juice someone has at home. We thank you for it now. Lord, and die with that spiritual significance of what you did on the cross. That we are not our own. We are bought with a price. You paid for our salvation with your precious blood. We thank you for that day. So we give you now our tears. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let us come in together now, my brother, my sister, uh, by taking our uh, cracker and our uh, juice. Let us come in together now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. service, I want to be to remind you, please continue to sow a seed into this congregation. Give it, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and run it over. The same measure you give, it shall be given back unto you. Please, beloved, continue to sow that seed. We pray the Lord that as he richly blesses you, that you be a blessing, truly a blessing here at Adler Baptist Church in the kingdom of God. God bless you real good. And have him continue to smile upon you. Don't change that channel. These wonderful men behind me gonna bless you. Amen. As I close this election. Glory, glory. Hallelujah.
Yeah. 